please? Thank you very much. Uh, we're here for council briefing and Mr. Stavakos, the floor is yours. Good evening. We have a handful of topics to go over with council tonight. Um, I believe we've also got the second half of the briefing open for open floor with council discussion. So we'll try to get through the staff issues as quickly as we can. Uh, the first item that we have for you is an update on the Lakeside Drive, Seagate Avenue gate. Um, council uh, had asked us to go back and find out a little bit more information related to low-speed vehicles, of which City Attorney uh, Chris Ambrosio is here to report on. And we'd like to follow that up with a, uh, an analysis that uh, Fire Marshal Shadow uh, put together, along with an internal team, to uh, take a look at the different options that are available for the actual gate operation itself. So we'll start off with Chris with the low speed vehicles. Okay. So I did some further low speed, re further research on low speed vehicles and then also golf carts, um, knowing that that wasn't the main topic, but they sort of go hand in hand when you're looking at one or the other. I thoroughly researched all the statutes, the Florida Department of Highway Safety, Division of Motor Services documents, um, and other authorities that come under the statute, just secondary um, legal resources that are provided associated with the statute. And then I also looked at St. John's County Ordinance, City of Jacksonville, Nocopee Villa Villages, Atlantic Beach, Neptune Beach, Fernandina Beach, and Nassau County, um, just to get an idea of what some of the local area jurisdictions are doing, and then also uh, with respect to the villages, I couldn't think of a single community in the state of Florida that probably uses more golf carts and low speed vehicles than the villages. So mm -hmm. I figured I might as well go to the leader in that area. <laughs> so I went to that as well. So um, my opinion hasn't changed much from what it was a couple of months ago with respect to low speed vehicles. Um, the low speed vehicles are, are certainly limited to use on streets. There is no discretion for us to allow low speed vehicles to be used on sidewalks, paths of some sort, and, and certainly not a multi-use path that St. John's County appears to have created their own definition of a multi-use path. There's no definition of such a, a path in the statutes with respect to the motor vehicle statutes, the transportation facility statutes. So I, I'm not, I will go into the problems of the St. John's County Ordinance if you'd like, um, but I would strongly suggest that we do not model ourselves after that ordinance. They've created a situation where it appears that they've attempted to exercise some discretion to allow low-speed vehicles to be used on a St. John's County created and defined multi-use path where the low-speed vehicles will be interacting with bicyclists and pedestrians. And that is absolutely not allowed by the statutes. And the, the statutes are so simply crafted that it appears that St. John's has blended several concepts of different statutes and created this path where they're allowing multiple uses. It's not allowed. So low-speed vehicles are limited to operations on streets, and there's a very strict restriction with that. The only discretion that we could exercise that is worked into the low-speed vehicle statute is that you have the discretion to prohibit the operation of low-speed vehicles on streets if the city determines that such prohibition is necessary in the interest of safety. That's the only discretion that we can that you can exercise in the low speed vehicle statute. Golf carts are not to be operated. The standard is that golf carts are not operated on roads or streets, but that you may exercise your discretion to designate certain roads to allow golf carts to be used on those roads. In the end, you have to go through four or five steps to ensure that if they can be safely utilized on that road, um, and that there's a certain speed limit restriction, but that's golf carts on roads. Um, the issue that the council asked me to look into, and I know that certain members of the um, city have 
been interested in hearing about is whether the low-speed vehicles can be somehow worked, somehow utilized on a path that the council may want constructed next to the lakeside gate area. And my recommendation to the council is, is no, that we should not create a path um, in which we can and should assume that pedestrians and bicyclists will be using that path and that the council permits and authorizes most of the vehicles to be used on that path be contrary to the statutes. We'd be creating a, uh, what I would consider to be a, a risk and a hazard. Um, the statutes don't afford us that discretion. I don't think we'd be protected by sovereign immunity because the discretion that you are allowed to exercise is to prohibit low-speed vehicles from being operated on roadways. Otherwise, um, we're setting a, we're creating a duty of care where none exists, and we'd be creating a risky situation, and we, we shouldn't do that. The other jurisdictions beyond St. outside of St. John's County, City of Jacksonville has it exactly right. They say low-speed vehicles are not allowed on sidewalks and they follow the statute. And they stay away from low-speed vehicles in every other way within their code. Um, Atlantic Beach and Neptune Beach don't even, don't even discuss low-speed vehicles and golf carts. They are clearly just letting the statutes speak for them. Fernandina Beach does the same. Don't, they don't touch either one of them. Nassau County makes no comment on low-speed vehicle, but what they do is they address golf carts and they state that um, they have a, a pretty nice code, of, uh, an ordinance that says, you know, golf carts may be operated on particular roads that the county designates, and, and that's golf carts, and, th and they're doing it the right way with respect to golf carts. How old uh, statutes? Are they old statutes? Because I mean, go uh, golf carts or low-speed vehicles are <coughs> something that's new, relatively new, and becoming more popular. Right. So yeah, the, they're, the low-speed vehicles are effective 2013, golf carts 2015. Right. So not not very old, not in, in my opinion. Those are you know not not even ten years old. Um, what do you think so about two paths? Right. One designated for low speed vehicles, and one designated for multi use. Right. Yeah. I don't. I would. I would suggest not doing that at all. No, I, I I think that we should stick to what the statute says. Is that low speed vehicles are to may be operated on streets and roads. What about a designated low-speed vehicle path on the street? Um, that concept is not provided for in the statutes. It's separate lanes, similar to a bike, bike lane. lane. Exactly. Yeah, that concept isn't set forth in the statutes at well, all. It would be in compliance with the statute because they'd be driving on the street. Well, remember that our detour route is not a street or a road for our purposes in terms of the definition of a street or a road pursuant to the, the transportation code. It, it's not a street or a road facility. It, we, the council has determined it to just be limited only to a detour during bridge closures, closures or emergencies. So it technically is, it doesn't meet the definition of a street or a road. So I looked into the definitions of those. And that, that detour route it doesn't it doesn't qualify as a street or a road because when, of course, when the bridge is open, that gate will be closed. It still will only be um, utilized for during bridge closures or emergency weather events. I believe. It's still so a street, we're, right? I mean, it's still defined as a street. It's we're just closed off. No, it's we, not. We, it's not. We we just have it as a detour, some sort of um, it's temporary uh, construction. It's temporary construction detour, right? Right. Can we, if we build it as a bicycle pedestrian path, do we have to sign it as no low speed vehicles and no golf cart carts? carts? If we just, if we build it for the specification, and I mean, I mean, people are going to know not to use it, or I mean, if they choose to use it, then they're, it's just like they're speeding, you know? I mean, you know, we're going to put a police officer there, <coughs> people that utilize it, or do we need to actually sign it and say, don't? that it's not for golf carts or low speed vehicles. Yeah, if, if we if we have it open and it's wide enough and there aren't, you know, for example, cement posts or poles or um, metal poles. I mean, that's, I mean they fit through on, I mean, golf carts fit through on uh, 
Atlantic Beach. And well, no, here first, in, Jackson, in Jacksonville Beach on First yeah. Street. I mean, people yeah, they, drive they, through those all the time. They fit through, but um, if those may not be designated as for golf cart you know, for golf carts. But I would suggest that we don't encourage the use of low-speed vehicles where we know pedestrians and bicyclists are going to be. Well, I'm saying, I mean, what we need to, if we're going to put a path there, because, I mean, we want a path to allow pedestrians and people to right. walk through the neighborhood and stuff, are we going to have to sign that as no no golf carts or low-speed vehicles or just leave it the way it is? We can leave it the way it is because... Well, we should probably have, we should probably do something to discourage the use of low-speed vehicles. And I say that because we, we know that there's going to be a propensity for some, certain people to use that for low-speed vehicles. And we may want to take the necessary steps to ensure that that small path is only used by right. pedestrian and bicycles. I mean, they just took the posts out in Neptune Beach that they put on the sidewalk along for the boulevard. Because they were putting them there so they wouldn't, people wouldn't use them. And I'm not sure why they chose to take them out, but right. yeah, you know they took those because I mean it's not it's not it's a safety issue also for the bicyclists. Something has to really hit. Yeah, well, well, I mean keep in mind that you know low speed vehicles can operate at 25 miles per hour. Sure. So it, I would say that the the jurisdictions that I looked at that plainly say low speed vehicles are not to be operated on sidewalks. That, that is the policy that I would suggest we follow. Yes. And, and we keep low-speed vehicles away from the same areas, sidewalks or paths, that a pedestrian is going to be using. But on, six, on 16th North, I mean, it's so narrow that, you, that they've got to, they're slowing down to three miles an hour to squeeze through there. Yeah. I mean, and we don't care. I mean, it discourages their use. Uh, but I mean, other than sitting there and ticketing them, I mean, is there... What what is I mean? Can they get a ticket for it? Is it a moving violation? Is it um, yeah, they 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 all, the, the low speed vehicles are held to the same standards as a vehicle, as an automobile vehicle. Same standards. That's why they have to be titled, registered, the driver's sure. license um, has to be. How do, how, do you, how do you know? How do you know as a driver of one of those that you're not supposed to go through those openings on 16th North? Well, ideally, you know, we're all held to the general understanding or knowledge of what the Florida statutes say. So if you're a low-speed vehicle owner and operator, you should be familiar with these statutes. And in, ter in terms of getting the license and the title and the sure. registration, there's, there's literally only but one or two statutes that a low-speed vehicle operator and owner would need to read, and they would see clearly that they're only allowed to operate on roadways. But that is a roadway still. Uh, well, our path wouldn't be a roadway. Well, the... I mean, we have like a small median in the middle of the road that has two op an opening on each side that's about four feet. Right. Three, Something four. <coughs> right by the church. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. 16th North. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm just, but I mean, that that is a road still. It yeah, it's still a road. road. It just has a, yeah, I, I just don't know, you know. Yeah. yeah. Would, we be, would we be able to designate a portion of the street as a at low speed vehicle length? In some fast fashion, I, I don't. I don't see anywhere where that's where that's possible. I don't see that as a permissible. Yeah, because the gate's going to be closed. No, are you talking about opening the gate the width of a low speed vehicle? Correct. But you just a street, do the, it has to be a street. It's a street. So you have a street, and then you just do the low speed vehicle lane, and then the gate's right here. And then this is only wide enough for a, not a car, but a low speed vehicle to get through. I mean, but they don't get motorcycles and other stuff. Too. I mean, I know it's one of the things. I mean, if, I mean if, yeah. If you put, if you just put a pedestrian path there, other people are going to use it. I mean, even if they're not supposed to. I mean, we can. I agree. We can take well, them and, and legally and legally enforce that they're not supposed to be there. The same you said with Far Street. I mean, bikes, motor, motor bikes motorcycle and motorcycles can use that too. Exactly. That. I mean, but it's it, that's somebody taking the app, making the conscious effort to get around it. Um, and it'd be the same with this path. Oh. People will go through. And mopeds and but we are bikes. we are in agreement that I mean that we are putting some kind of pedestrian path or something some access not in the street though not the same so you would have this is in the yeah. street and then you can have a pedestrian path over here where well there's kind of a new line I know it's not but it's just there, is, there is a pedestrian yeah. path currently there that's right yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. the, the current configuration is wide enough for a pedestrian 
And, and it's, what size is this? <laughs> it has some sharp turns that yeah. really only a pedestrian can make, or perhaps a person walking their bike. Could somebody get a stroller through there? Stroller, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but a low-speed vehicle cannot fit you there. I, mean, I just want to be able to tell the residents why. And, and if you're saying that there's there's uh, statutes to say that it's a liability for the city, okay. I mean. They'll be upset, okay. but I mean, it's, that's it's a reason. We're not just making excuses. Oh, yeah. There, there is clearly a set of statutes that, that make this limitation very obvious that a low-speed vehicle should only be operating on the street. There is definitely a limitation on the discretion that a local agency can exercise with respect to low-speed vehicles. That discretion is to prohibit the operation of low-speed vehicles on the streets. There is no other room for discretion for you to create paths or sidewalks or to allow a multi-use area where you can have low-speed vehicles and pedestrians on the same path. Okay. That's why the city of Jacksonville has completely n narrowed it down to what the statute allows, operation on street, and they explicitly say, low speed vehicles are not to be operated on the sidewalks. <coughs> so th they are clearly making this distinction. We do not want pedestrians and low speed vehicles on the same section of path or sidewalk at all. And they're reading the statute correctly. If we try to mix the concepts, that's where we get into the St. John's County problems. And they they took some steps to try to, I think, correct themselves after they enacted their ordinance, and a year later they did an amended ordinance, and they actually caused more problems for themselves. <laughs> so by mixing the concepts of golf carts, pedestrian sidewalk areas, low-speed vehicle, and the areas where all of these can be utilized, they've created a, 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 a dangerous situation, quite frankly. We need to avoid all of that, and I know as of, at this point it is to a few members of our community that want to use low-speed vehicle to be able to go back, you know, over that detour route or whatever, whatever we're calling it, we can't, we should not do that. And I would recommend to the council that we don't do that. And I would say that we should stay true to the statutes and, and not try to come up with some exercise <coughs> of um, blending them together. And you, we may be risking the sovereign immunity that we maintain by going outside of the statutes and trying to create something that the statutes don't allow. I just have a problem with that when they're Jack Speech residents and they have no way of going through there. Right. I think I just have a problem with that. So I think a proper solution would be then to create, they have to drive on the street to create a lane and at least allow them access through there as a Jack Speech resident. That's the problem that I have with it. And, right. and so that's why want some <coughs> sort of solution to provide them access, not with a vehicle, but they should at least have access. With the amount of property taxes that, that, that they pay and, and having zero access doesn't make any sense to me, unless they walk. That's just how I personally feel. Yeah, I do too, but I mean, I, I think, I mean, if, if there's nothing we can do about it. No, I think there is, but I think they, how, how they, do you, they drive on the street. Well, how do you make, how do you, designate that as a street, what needs to be done to that piece of property in order to uh, make it a street? Is it not a street? Well, it's it's not a street, and yeah. it's, it's we're, con we're contemplating reversing, I think, what was decided by the council in the resolution, which is that this was just a detour route for purposes of use during bridge closures, and that the gate was to completely be closed. <coughs> there was no concept of us re-engineering or redesigning it as a street or a road and continuing lakeside so that it becomes a permanent street. I mean, we haven't looked into that because council's direction was this is just a detour around. No, if, we, if we make it a permanent street, then they're going to make, then they're going to want to open. Then it's right. Gonna, it's going to end up being open. Right. We're right. Going, we're going back down that. And we would also suggest at that time redesigning it to our current roadway standards, which means we'd have to look at turning radius, roadway width, acceptable two-lane travel, et cetera, which if you've driven on those roads, it currently does not meet minimum standards. Right, right. curbing, and, and you, right. you know better than yeah. any of us, yeah. yeah. Curbing and uh, drainage and slopes, uh, yeah. all of that would have to be engineered so it becomes part of the roadway system. But as it currently exists, it's, it's not that. Um, the, the, 
frankly, the, the council decided in its resolution that this was just a, a temporary detour route. And, and um, if, we're, if we're to change that into a street or a road and no longer a cul-de-sac setting, we yeah, I'm not in support of that. I'm in support of t taking a designated four feet and making that the thoroughfare for sole purpose of low speed vehicles. And if we have to designate that four feet as a street in order to be able to legally do that, I would support doing that. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Certainly not opening it up. Right. But that's I, not, but I guess that gets us to our solution, in my opinion, is a way to get us to our solution in a crafty way without changing the dynamics of the uh, end of the lakeside. But in order to build a street, you have to build it toward, to the city's specifications um, and design standards. It's not as a low speed vehicle. We just designate four feet of it as a street. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't, I don't agree with that because there's, there are certain definitions of what a, a street and a road is within the transportation code and Florida statutes. And, and it's clear that the legislature intended for low speed vehicles to only be operating on those which are streets and roads, the way that they define them to be. If we create some sort of new version of a street or a road that's four feet wide or five feet wide, I, I think that we're, we're treading on that same concept of creating a road or a path or some sort of area where a low speed vehicle can be operated that's not a statutory defined street or road. And we should, we should anticipate that the, you know, the, most of the vehicles won't be the only users of that small area there. There will be pedestrians and bicyclists and skateboarders sure. and you know the young young people on their skateboards and strollers. And strollers. So I mean, that's what the statutes are clearly attempting to avoid: is to keep these low speed vehicles, which are essentially small cars, because they're held to the same standards and requirements as a, as a driver or. A, car would be held to, plus the you know, title registration, the, having the insurance and all the other aspects of a car, they're clearly trying to keep these grocery vehicles away from pedestrians. There's no question. That's, that's the goal for safety purposes. And, and that's why the statute reads that, that you may exercise your discretion to not even allow them on roads if you feel that it would be in the best interest of safety for your citizens. There isn't a converse to that, which is in the interest of, I don't know what, use or flexibility for residents, you may determine which kind of pathway a low-speed vehicle can operate on. That, that's not a, an available decision for you to make. Do you hear enough on low-speed vehicles for now? Okay, we're gonna switch gears to the second half of the conversation, which is, the uh, use of the gate and some of the different options. And Steve, have you already passed out? I did. Everybody has copies of it. Everybody should have a copy of the memo that uh, we, we put Steve in charge of a, an internal group of employees to take a look at what the different options okay. were with regards to control of the gates mm -hmm. and uh, also to take a look at how the first responders are going to be responding to the area in question <coughs> once the gate is permanently closed. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. All right, so what we did, the group was made up of Beaches Energy, Police Department, Public Works, the IT Department, and the different devices that may be needed inside of it. Um, I met with Jack's Fire Chief Dave Grounds from Jack's Fire, who's stationed up here, and he gave the input from everybody. Took a, involved in the group, we were looking at the different ways for this gate that we have over there. There's a large, as you guys all know, there's a large variety of ways to open the gates now. With card swipes, uh, security cards that are coming up, uh, this, the decal openings in there, push buttons. So we put all this together in uh, our suggestions, and I had representatives of Armstrong Gate come out and meet with us to go over ideas. And he was able to help steer us in some of them because there's a lot of vandalism with gates, especially back in that area. And he, he was saying, this is gonna be a problem slot area, so he recommended some of the items I have down here now. We went from the very simplest, which is just servicing the gate we have there now, to 
going down, having cell phone operations is one of the choices. And the final, the fourth choice on there will be the card reader along with the cell phone the, uh, and a decal opener. When we start looking at these uh, pros and cons, we're trying to figure out how just going to use this gate. So we went to the police department and their policy is they don't want to depend on something electrical or mechanical. They want to drive and rush there and then they have to turn around and drive back around to get in. Jack Spire is already, once the bridge is done, they're making the switch where the engines are coming from Atlantic Beach. The units that are here may, may not use it. That's up to them. They're not really dependent on that gate. They won't have to worry about whether the gate's going to operate. Um, as long as it had the Knox key lock like we have on it now, they were fine and happy. They didn't see any need for any change because it's going to be very seldom used. Any of the other forces coming would be coming from Atlantic Beach or down where they wouldn't even know that maybe they get lost if they got back into Ocean Forest neighborhood. And so they had no concern with any of that issue. So when you ruled out the uh, emergency services impact, that it wasn't going to impact emergency services with, with the change, then we went to the utilities. Um, we talked to Beaches Energy, they had their input and public works. So we came up with these options. When you look on that sheet down there, the, uh, when we go down there, some of the things we have on it or past the uh, emergency service we said it was done. Special knowledge needed to operate the gate when there's a problem with it, when it fails. They do fail with the one city yard we have. It, you know, it, it has issues on there. Um, is there any special device required to put in the vehicle? Since we've got almost 100 officers, you know, when you put that in Jack's fire, we could be using it. SO and all these others, if we're going to put this gate, we need to make sure everybody can access it. So, whether we're issuing out key fobs or IDs or, or other items to make the gate work with decals and then maintaining that. And we thought that was going to be pretty, uh, pretty sure to maintain and make sure it all works for everybody when they need it to work. And, uh, um, one of the good things on this list, you'll see we have the, uh, we're looking at security for all our city buildings and that would interact, the gate opening could interact with the those new security badges when and if that happens, that proposal. Again, though, it's still mechanical, it still depends on electric, it still depends on everything being keyed right. If you just go with the uh, cell phone, because that was another option we had, where you could use a cell phone to open the gate, that's a great idea, except for you're giving out a cell phone signal to 100 people. Well, it, you know how when you give out codes and things, it goes beyond all that. So we thought maybe the dispatch, if it just the dispatcher would have that, you could call and they can open this mechanical gate for you there. And that was one of the options on there. Uh, they don't have gates now that if they lose power, they just unlock. But they don't roll open and things. They could, but they're still, this is a very large, if you look at that, the cantilever gate, it's a very large gate. It's heavy. The police department has the same style of gate. They have problems with the police department with this gate. And, and you have to be able to disengage the gate know how to disengage it to push it back. But it is an option that, that's on there. Um, I was thinking of an arm. You know what you see in there? The arm where they can go underneath right. it. Right, and then if and we then lose the power, it just opens. Yeah. So there's nothing that needs to be yeah. moved. Or what we were looking at, and we could change all together, but what we were looking at, it's a long arm. Um, long arm, arm would so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, the, what we have there already, you see the prices, um, rough prices that were bid out to repair it. We have the one price on there, the 35, around the $3,500 mark, just to have the service where it rolls and easy to open and close. And then, uh, which, if our own public works, they said they would do it. But I figured these, if, if we contacted out, that's what it would be. And then we go into the electrical needs for the other prices on there and the different things installed. For the electric, that does not kill, include Beaches Energy's cost of running, dropping the power line, running up and putting the meter in there. So there's more cost over what's shown in here. I did not have that at the time. But what the group came back with in the utilities, they very rarely go over there and the need for the gate and everything, they were all fine with just using the simple manual key if they have to get in and unlock the lock. So it's, when our group got together, that's what we were recommending after we had all these cool ideas and things to operate this gate. And it just came down to it, what is the most beneficial for for the city and for us, and the most dependable and beneficial, we came back with just the manual 
the manual key lock. And if a problem does when we have storms and the hurricanes and everything, well, the works will do like they normally do. Go out way ahead of time, open the gate, it stays open from that point on where people can get in and out. Uh, this gate usage, the sanctuary is in worse shape than this because if they get their road blocked, they're, they're stuck. We, they don't have quite as good a um, reserve out the back, you know, where there's a second wave in there, but it's not as nice as this. So that's, that's where we're at on this. Uh, you have plenty of options there. We recommended, the first option we recommended on, on our list was the, uh, just the manual. Then it came down to the cell phone and just leaving dispatch with that cell phone signal so they could call it and the gate would open uh, at that time. So the tri trucks are going to come from the Neptune side? Like they did before. So it's just police? Uh, the police are coming from Neptune. They said, uh, Chief Police said they're not going to use this. They don't depend on the, the gates and everything. Chief, Chief's here if you wanted him to come up and speak to this issue. But uh, you know, one of his concerns was if he has an officer that's responding to an emergency call, they're not going to take the chance that they're going to drive up to the gate and find out there's a problem with the gate where now they have to get out of the car and try to do some type of a manual override to open it. Right. They're naturally just going to go to the north route and come in from north to south. That's just the way they're going to respond to an emergency situation. 30 seconds more or something? Correct. Yeah. As opposed to get night and caught in the lock, or it should probably take longer. <laughs> well, yeah. they didn't, I don't know if every police car would have to lock on it to do that. Yeah, the cars? I don't, the fire trucks do, but the police cars, I don't right. know if they have right. Yeah. So the, the, the reason we wanted to bring this back to you all was because obviously the resolution that you passed asked us to go out and take a look at some types of uh, ways of opening it quicker in an emergency situation. And what we're finding out is that both public safety departments, police and fire, are not going to rely on the gate as a means of primary ingress, egress to that area. But we did want to present you with all of the options that we identified to see if you had any input for us going forward. Now, my main concern was rescue, and since we no longer have the fire department, it's really not an issue anymore as far as that goes. Right. The response time is the same no matter what kind of game you're I, um, I think simpler is definitely going to be better in this case. So um, it seems to me a combination lock over trying to keep track of keys might make more sense. But you brought up a good point about having it open uh, in the event of a storm. Yeah. So do we have a policy statement on that, or can we do something where the residents back there will know if we're in tropical storm warning, tropical storm watch, or whatever the case may be, it that would trigger us keeping it open? They would know. Yeah, we could put that. That would be easy to, to put that in our MCE and PDF. That way we would have it. It's been policy, but it's it's something probably that's not written down anywhere to do that. 72 to 48 hours out, you can go and unlock the gate and leave it open until, right? mm -hmm. yeah. For the uh, state of emergency. Is you're making a legal de uh, designation. Correct. So <coughs> that. Okay. Yeah. Any yeah. other need from us? Or? I mean, it sounds like uh, I think we got it on this particular item. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, being respectful of time, I'm going to do these out of order and ask that the golf course employees come up. Yeah, Bruce sure. coming up. And uh, Bruce is going to give everybody an update with regards to uh, the golf course restaurant. He always, seems to have, he always seems to have good news these days. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> no always pressure. No, it is good. We, uh, you know, Dave Hines, uh, Hines uh, with his team very group, has had a lot of communication and, uh, with the new group Sneakers here at the beach to have a satellite location called Sneakers on the Creek. So they're trying to work out everything as far as the details for everything that would take place to make this happen and uh, hopefully we'll come to you on March 2nd for approval. This has been, you know, a couple of months of a lot of different groups in and out, but this group in particular has really uh, worked very well with Gabe and uh, in that group as a whole and we feel like this would be a really something really, really good for us. We're on the marketing side when we talk about marketing dollars and um, you know, to be able to advertise us at Sneakers uh, for any you know, people staying at hotels, you go to Sneakers, here's the golf course right here. So it's kind of an easy fit from that side of it. So 
that's uh, basically where we're going to be. We've got you know, some hard and fast uh, meetings here in the next couple of weeks to make sure that they're in agreement with uh, everything they want to put through. And hopefully on March 2nd, we present this and get this done. Were they, cost, so. were they the only restaurants that showed interest? There was a couple of others, and I think uh, there's a few reasons why we feel like this is the best fit. Um, you know, this is, they want to provide a good restaurant atmosphere, and we feel like maybe some of the other ones wanted a little bit more than uh, what we would want them to provide for us as far as festivals and concerts and a number of different. Uh, I think it's also important to note yeah. too from a, from a procedural perspective, uh, we're looking at doing this as an assignment of lease. This is where yes. the, the existing owner of the current restaurant facility has had discussions with city staff about assigning his lease to a new entity for operation. So this is not going through a traditional RFP process because the, the current owner <coughs> is involved in the process of doing an assignment of this lease. And they understand exactly that they're assigned, they're assuming the exact same lease as TD Green has right now. There might be, you know, a change, a small change or two with regards to the beverage part maybe, uh, but for the most part, everything's exactly as the letter of the law is with the current contract. But do, they, do TD Green still have any ownership or any part of the new <coughs> contract? This would or be a 100% transfer. Total yes. transfer? Yes. Okay. And, and again, this is where this is where Tita Green and Sneakers are having their conversations and involving us in the process because we are the ones that, in accordance with the lease agreement, have to sign off on any assignment of the lease. Mm -hmm. So we have to be comfortable with whatever the two of them come to an agreement on mm -hmm. and approach us. If we're 100% acceptable, then you know, we would bring it to council for your ratification. Uh, but really, we're still in the conversation phase at this point in time. But it, it appears that it's going in a very positive direction now. Do they need anything from us as far as, I know we, we give T.D. Green some money to open up. Are sneakers going to be looking for anything with that? One of, the, one of the things we talked about is that the current lease agreement that we have with T.D. Green still has some uh, matching funds available within that agreement that were not utilized at the time they did modifications. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that funding is still available in case they wanted to make some additional modifications to the current facility. Um, additionally, I believe in about another 18 months, September 30th, of 21. September 30th of 2021 is when the first renewal of the lease would come up. And at that point, we'd have the opportunity to sit down with the new ownership group and see if there were any improvements they wanted to make to the property and how we could be a, a party of that to make it happen. I'm, I'm just baffled that the, that company could not make money. I mean, the golf course. Well, they made money. Just <laughs> not a lot. They, well, didn't. they didn't put it back into the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, um, I think after our first uh, episode back in February, I think the two remaining partners uh, were really more the financial driving force behind the business, not mm -hmm. necessarily operationally. And they're a little bit fish out of water. They're not sure exactly uh, where their role was, what to do, how to do it properly. And uh, I think it's just kind of a, a downward spiral from there, sadly. But yeah, they're it should uh, be a lucrative. Uh, oh, this group business? is excited like I've never yeah. seen before. I mean, just the opportunity. A captive audience right yes. there. Yeah, they've got a lot of uh, really good thoughts and ideas as to what we can do, uh, especially with the range cover coming in. And, you know, it's just automatic. So, yeah, they're, they're very, very excited. Well, I have to say, I ate there at the golf course, and I wasn't real thrilled with it. So I'm hopeful that sneakers will step up the game. Yeah. On I got a great day. hot dog. I, don't, I mean, I know I'm Irish, but I don't want to be a green. I guess it was mature. <coughs> but, uh, I think the fact that they're already an established major restaurant in our community, and a long time restaurant in our community, this will really, hopefully, if they play their cards right, will just be even more of a satellite operation. Sure. And when Sneakers is really busy during football season, it kind of counterbalances when golf really picks up. So. Hopefully, instead of that's all their eggs are in that basket, this is really just a complement to what mm -hmm. they're already doing. And they've had, and part of their, you know, the tough part that they struggle with is parties, private parties, they get asked a lot, uh, company, you know, office parties, Christmas parties, birthday parties. And it's kind of hard to have a party for 20 to 30 people in the warehouse. Right? There's not, <laughs> there, there's no private anything there. So the opportunity for, you know, the golf course to close down at 6.30 this time of year, and then have whatever, uh, 
event afterwards provides them that venue, then now this is truly a private party at this place, and it brings more notoriety and uh, you know marketing to the golf course. You said range cover a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? We're in the process where we we have in the budget uh, and the it'll hopefully get installed. We've got a, a couple of companies we're still working with um, that hopefully will have it done uh, in, in May before the heat. We'll have a lights that have power, so we'll have to have some lights, fans eventually, maybe. The fans part sounds great, but at the beach, it seems like it's always well stuck. It's kind yeah, of pretty, pretty, pretty windy. Uh, but we'll have lights underneath it and uh, the music. The flick bass? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're coming yeah. from the song or the rain? Yeah, and there'll be like a back curtain to it, so it'll certainly help us. And so I'm going to bring to you on uh, March 2nd also a range machine. So currently what we do, the procedure that we have in place with the volume that we just didn't anticipate having this much volume, especially well, you know, more than a year after uh, the grand opening, it just seems like it's like tomorrow on a random Tuesday, our first available is three o'clock tomorrow. And it's been like that for a couple of days. So, you know, the volume continues to, to, to grow and the procedures we've got in place, the resources we have available to us right now uh, are so that we can't do what we're doing when we have a range cover, we have, you know, 30 to, who knows, 100% more, uh, more traffic on the range. So it will be, uh, I think it's about, after it's all said and done, $22,000 for the machine. It's all self-sustaining, it runs outside, it washes the balls, it basically eliminates us from having the operational costs are gonna be you know, paid for in a heartbeat. So we're, uh, we're excited with that. <coughs> Cover, music, lights. Any problem with the amplifying music? It's a good question, we are talking about that. You know, that we'll have to kind of figure that out. We were talking about that earlier, how the wind uh, direction plays uh, big role in that, you know, as far as making anybody angry in the surrounding uh, neighborhoods or apartments that would have to be watchful. How about related to ordinance? Oh yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah. 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 Sure. And it'd be at the property line. Yeah, they got a lot of right away. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's it's going to be on the oh, street, on the property line. It's not like at the golf. And I think that's completely up to us to uh, control that. And if we have the more speakers we have, uh, the more we, you don't need to have them turned up, you can hear it just fine. So we can have a little volume at certain times of the night. Well, people don't want music blasting out. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. They want to listen to golf. Well, well it's also <laughs> an opportunity for us to do a number of marketing things. So uh, if we've got the, all the bays full, and we can say, you know, hey, the 952 single, Bruce Moeller is on the tee, please report to the starter. That's nice. That's something right. that not a lot of people have that access to. Uh, if Happy hour starting at five o'clock and it's four fifty-five. Hey, happy hour starts in half an hour and it's amplified to everybody there. So cool. there's a number. Of, yeah, it'll be fun. What uh, time? Once all this stuff is done, when do you expect you're going to close? And would you remain open for private parties? Uh, close the, the, the range. The range. Yeah. The range. Um, it depends. I mean, the research we've done shows that pretty much seven thirty is that time frame that people uh, want to go home. So at this time of year, when it gets darker. Uh, we'll see how it goes in the summer. So you'd be flexible? We'd be very flexible. And what about private parties? Would you leave the range open for private parties? Sure. Okay. Yeah, Still music after 10? No music after 10. Yeah. And that's the other thing with the previous uh, concessioner company. They, uh, they didn't know that you had to keep your kitchen open in order to sell alcohol. Or start having it open. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it'd be nice to be nice to them to actually you know, buy it. since they're a representative, they're representing the city. Yes. It'd be good if they actually, yes. you know. The very first day they got there, they they've done a couple of with you know, <coughs> working with with uh, Peter Green to kind of come in and kind of inspect and, and monitor. Uh, the very first day they were there, they got there at seven o'clock in the morning, and by nine o'clock they came and told me said, "We're in." I mean, if, you know, two hours on a Wednesday morning with nothing but seniors playing, they realize how much of a miss uh, that they've had. So that, that showed a lot. That should be breakfast. People eat breakfast, I think. They do. Yeah, I'm sure. It's one to three. The cook doesn't come in until nine. And that's part of what we're going to go through September 30th of next year is really clarifying the lease. What's acceptable to us? What's not acceptable? There's nothing there that says they have to serve breakfast at this time. There's nothing there that says, um, if you run out of Bud Light for three weeks in a row, that's a bad thing, right? It's a bad 
be for us. Uh, so I want to be more clear when we redo the lease on what our expectations truly are in black and white, not a little bit subjective like you Especially for the monthly price that's in the current lease. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. I would love it. And they have shown exactly. And they have shown concern <laughs> uh, towards when we go to the renegotiation September 30th of next year of having a few dollars uh, matching for you know physical improvements of the property. So we'll talk about that. Any other questions for Bruce? And before he steps away from before he steps away from the table, I just want to remind everybody that both Bruce and Trevor were recognized by the Jacksonville Area Golf Association as being the outstanding professionals in their respective fields for this position. Wow. And, and, and they each have the trophy to show for it, although yeah. Trevor's trophy is bigger than yes. Bruce's. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. Size doesn't matter. I will say, though, at that event, it was great to hear the other golf professionals yeah. in Northeast Florida applauding what we've done with the, with the Jack's Beach course, and those are people who really, really know what they're talking about. Uh, Not that we are. <laughs> Last item we have for you is uh, a quick update on the paid parking program. We actually have some items on council for tonight. We'll have another one coming in a few weeks as well. Uh, but we're going to have Ashley just walk through really quickly what, what tonight's items are all about. So we're going to ask you to consider two items tonight um, the amendment to our contract for paid parking and then a resolution, which basically restates what the amendment is and sets the fees for the new year. Um, we covered a draft of the amendment with y'all in the briefing in November, but what is included here is us clarifying um, our relationship with SP Plus to collect citations um, on our behalf and to remit those funds to us, and then if need be, when they send those funds to collections, um, empowering them to send them to collections and then setting the rate, the cost sharing arrangement with collections and us. Um, the fees themselves are exactly the same as last year, so the customer will have the same experience as last year. Um, one thing we added in the amendment this year is we found, as we were reviewing the payments, that they had set the resident rate at the maximum daily amount of $7, but the experience that we were seeing was averaging about $5. So we asked in the amendment to set a resident rate of $5 because it, per the contract, we're responsible for reimbursing the contractor for every resident that parks in there. So mm -hmm. we have to give them 40% of the resident rate. So it saves the city a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, with the, oh, What is the uh, the cost sharing percentage? 60-40. The city keeps 60% and the contractor gets 40% of all revenue. Is that pretty standard if we look at elsewhere, like what other relationships collections groups have with so the collections rate, when we send it off to a third party collection, the right. contractor has an um, agreement in place for 38% of the total collection. And when I looked around, that seemed kind of in a tolerable range. Okay. The, um, the amendment also allows the SB Plus to charge $10 administrative fee for every violation that they're processing. So it's their administration fee for the effort of monitoring the tickets, issuing them, and collecting them on our behalf. And so this is them collecting our parking tickets for us. And they get that whole thing? They would get the entire $10, and then the city would get the $25, which is set for our ordinance. Um, and then SB Plus would also get the parking rate for the day. So the total cost of $42 ends up kind of being a 40-60 split. But we're ensuring that the government revenue of the parking violation stays with us. Perfect. Are they paying the tax on yes. sales tax? So the sales tax is included in the rate. So the five dollar, seven dollar rate, we back out the sales tax and we're making out. It's just easier for the customers instead of having to pay the extra. Right. But and to, have you talked to them about because uh, the, there was a couple of issues last year regarding like visibility and lighting and the kiosks themselves. Are they adjusting anything this year or is it just gonna be the same as what we've had? I defer to the police. Talk about the signs. I would like to defer to Commander Shelley. <laughs> 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 Pass the book. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? So we asked SP Plus to go back in and give them some recommendations for some signs, and they did some mock ups for us, and they submitted those mock ups, and uh, we have gone with a sign that's a, it's a little bit better, uh, easier on the eye than the 
last year's complaint, they, they blended in a little bit too much. The first year, they were a little bit too ugly. Yeah. They didn't match any of our downtown area. So mm -hmm. we have set it on a third. We have set it on a sign for this year. Uh, kiosks, locations are staying the same. Everything's pretty much the same. The poles are already in place. Just these new signs will go up. Okay. Is it that notice at night as well? Like the lighting was, was kind of on the signs. There are no lights, so they become visible. But even the kiosks themselves are kind of, uh, you know, hard to find mm -hmm. at night. I don't know if there's anything we can do to, you know, eliminate it somewhat. Um, yeah, conversation about that. Yeah. Thank you. I got an email. It's uh, something worse the effect of you registered last year, so you're good to go for this year. Yes. Is that? Yes. That's how we're doing it for Yes. Because there was a little bit of confusion when we were right through. Yes, we put it out with uh, Jacob uh, on our frequently asked question on that. So we made it. We tried to make it clear in there in bold print that if they signed up last year, that they're okay for this year. And then on this mass email that went out last Friday at 6 a.m., uh, about 3,600 went out. And uh, we said the same thing too. Okay. We've also let everybody know we've got about 30, 40 new uh, registrations for this year. And we gave ourselves like a 14 day window to get those checked through THSMV, but uh, you know, it's only taking a few days, so we're getting those out. Yay or nay, but if you live in a municipal area of Jack's Beach or outside, okay. but you're good to go. So we've, we've started the registration process. We've sent out an email to everyone who was registered last year. We've got an FAQ up on the city's website. Uh, we've got new signage coming in based on a, a new format, and we're also looking at a handful of 15-minute parking spaces within the downtown as well to accommodate drop-off, pickup, uh, food pickup, etc. So, well, that was your idea when, yeah. when we brought this forward in November. So, we've got everything rocking and rolling, but the, you know, since this is the second year of a contract, it's not often that you're making changes to the contract. So we wanted to make sure that you were aware of the tweaks and, and uh, changes we were making specifically with regards to the fee structure and basically solidifying what we're actually collecting and what they're authorized to, to seek for collections on our behalf. Did we decide every two years or every three years for you guys to have to run, run through registrations? I don't think we really settled on a number, but actually now we're talking last week, probably after this year, we probably will. So yeah, it's a good idea to go through yeah. yeah, so that list. Yeah. I know it's a lot of work, so at least it's not every year, but... But if we have some advance notice, we can put some definitely some parties in place to okay. tackle that issue. Is there a, a, a way for residents to make sure that their plates are registered without having to call the police department? Because I've had people say, how do I know if I'm registered? Like right now you have to call the police department. Well, that's what, that, that was the, the purpose behind was sending out the email, uh, so they could so so they would know that, that, that they're good to go. So if they didn't, they, they get could an call. Email, yes, they could call and check. But so if they didn't get an email, then technically they might not be registered. Correct. Mm -hmm. so you didn't get one. Just put a list of all the all the uh, spreadsheet list of all the uh, license plate numbers, so people can just put them in alphabetical order. I mean, I don't think that would be too difficult. We can talk about it. We can talk about it with Jacob. We have to, you know, yeah. some kind of searchable. Yeah. yeah, that they can go on and look at and, and search there, right? Search their tag out to see if they're on. It would take them less time just to re-register. I mean, it doesn't. Take, right. You know, if you're not sure, just re-register. Right. Because it takes seconds to right. do it, right? Right. right. And I just want to compliment that email. Oh, yeah. Then we have to drop something. Up. Do we have to take something to the police department last time? Or you, can you can do it two ways. You can <coughs> pick up something here, the PDF, or register online. So if okay. they didn't get the email, just tell them to try again. Right, right. But I did want to compliment so, that email. <laughs> it looked professional. It was informative. It looked. It was really sharp, and the FAQ looked really good. Yeah. Well. So totally for saving all those emails for future use. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any other questions on paid parking? Oh, did it, has, it, has uh, SP Plus said anything about the uh, peer lot? Because that's obviously going to affect their uh, profits this year. I know there's nothing we can do. It's a two-year project, but they they, are, they know that that's uh -huh. that's out of commission. Yeah. I believe they do, and we yeah, haven't heard nothing at this point. Yeah. Most spots are taken. Probably that's about a quarter of the lot. It's, yeah, I want to say it's about 30 or 32 spots in total. And we still have the Margaritaville one renting space.
spaces Monday through Friday elsewhere on the other side. The, the north matters. side of the pier That's parking correct. lot. There's another lot to the north where they are using a portion of that parking lot for lay down. That's correct. And they're still not. Like it's still only Monday through Friday, not weekends. I believe, or that's, holidays. I believe that's correct. And um, I believe we're also collecting money from them for the rental of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it should be fun when they when they start work on the where the pier uh, restaurant was because a lot of people are using a lot of people are using that for parking now. You know, they're, they're not. So it's going to get it's going to get pretty tight during the summer once they start when they break ground. Parking will be a premium. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. Well, uh, there's only one last thing I wanted to uh, let council know. You probably all received an email about some changes we made to our agenda memo format. Uh, in particular. Uh, one of the big things we did was we removed the uh, action at the top and we changed the motions at the bottom to basically allow you an option of whether or not you wanted to approve or deny any items that are being brought in front of you. With that being said, um, I know that the practice has been that uh, when the item is first introduced that a motion is initially made and staff goes into a, a discussion, but perhaps the motion can be made after staff makes its presentation. So that way you can all decide whether or not you want to vote in the affirmative or the negative with regards to each item that's in front of you. Um, there was a, particular, a couple of particular items that we looked at where, uh, you know, where we said it's, it's probably not correct that we keep putting adoption or approval in front of you if the intention is that we're not recommending you do this or that we're, it may look like we're trying to steer you in a certain direction. So we wanted it to be up to your subjectivity of whether or not you want to approve or deny every item that comes in front of you. The uh, progression would still be uh, cursive for for those who pull out a card for those in the right after you. Yeah. Before the motion. Yeah. yeah. So he would just say comments from staff on the this agenda item? Yep. And just ask for your comments and then afterwards do I have a motion? In some cases, it may be just me doing an introduction and saying staff is here for Q&A, or in some cases, we may ask a staff member to come up and actually do a formal presentation with a handful of slides, depending on the complexity of the issue. And council discussion is after motion only? Correct. So if we have questions of the staff who are presenting, we have to wait till after the motion is made? That would probably be most appropriate. There's, there's going to be, he would bring the item up and then we'd make it available to citizen comment, then a go to motion, and then it open the floor to, to the council, and the council can ask staff to come back. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to call them back instead of asking them at the moment. Correct. Correct. So that um, led me to wonder what you guys thought about, it's been, tradition for the mayor pro time to make motions, but I don't think there's any sort of requirement there. Since we're redoing the process, do we want to take that time to redo? I think anybody can make the motion. I mean, she's just talking historically. Yeah, I mean, historically we have yeah. we always had kind of mayor pro time make motions, but I don't have any <coughs> private yeah. ownership there if we want to. I don't know if that's a practice that way. Make it simpler, and yeah. Yeah. we're not all making that resolution. <laughs> Does it bother you? It doesn't bother me, but I figured since this was, since we're taking another look at how we do things, then The remainder of the time is yours. So whatever you want to talk about for the next 20 minutes. I have a couple of them. Who's ready? I just wanted to look. Uh, I was thinking, um, I've been thinking about this for a while. All our city employees work very hard for us. Um, but I think, uh, our police department, you know, has goes, and all our employees go above and beyond. But our police department, uh, I've noticed, get worked to death. And uh, I was wanting to see if what you guys would think about lowering the retirement age for police officers, so they're not about <coughs> running after bad guys when they're in their seventies. Um, I believe now it's. 30 years 
for 90% pension. I could be wrong. Um, I <coughs> would want to see the cost of dropping that to maybe 25 years. And then, <coughs> I mean, if, it's, if you think it's a bad idea, that's a bad idea. But mm -hmm. um, That's a negotiation. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that was what I was going to suggest. But, Keep that we are entering into negotiations this year with FOP, and I understand that one of the items that we will be discussing at the table that they want to discuss with some of the retirement benefits. So, if, you know, time and age. Would be a, okay. uh, perhaps if that's one of the things. I guess for they, just on that, they, that dis on that discussion, is it if they retire at 25 years? Do they get three percent per year, or do they have to retire at 30? Or how does it work? What's it set up at that? At, uh, it's a multiplier and it's 3% times the years of service times their high five. Or you can go at 25 and 52 mm -hmm. to collect or 30 at any age. Oh, but either so you way, it's wait till 52 if you do 25. That's about 25 that's working right. Mm -hmm. right. So it's a union issue. Um, I mean, is this. And, is, and is that as, as, we, as we work through negotiations uh, with the union and, and We'll see what they propose. We will be bringing all of that to you along with the union contract issues. Okay. okay. Well, uh, maybe I uh, let the cat out of the bag then. Is there anybody from the police union there? Oh, yeah. Be quiet. Right. <laughs> but no, I was just it's something not. I was thinking about just because I see the stress they're on there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I didn't know that it was going to be part of negotiations. I'm sure it's not a specific line item for them. Um, but, you know, I just. Yes, we will. We will be having an initial shade meeting with you all. And then. Perhaps That's one, a good at term. least one more during the process. So we'll be bringing those things back to you. Yeah. I mean, I just read articles about how hard it is now for departments around the country to ha actually mm -hmm. hire mm -hmm. officers. So, mm -hmm. the, and we just did that pay increase across the board for general employees. So, I'm not talking about more pay. I, I think the quality of life issues are, are probably more important. And, uh, you know, so I was just throwing that out there. Okay. Compliment of 68, where are we now? Uh, GPI, Chief Smith, we, we still are, four short. We're uh, three short. I uh, have six applicants in the pool, and there's a possibility we won't hire any of them. Possibility we won't. We'll Correct. Um, I can't predict it, but I, I'd be, it's not for sure, but you know, we're picking on who we hire. And the, the quality of applicant has definitely decreased, and I'd rather go a little short than half. Wind up on CNN. Mm -hmm. I know y'all want to be worried. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, so we'll hold that we'll until we get into negotiations. All right. Okay. So, yeah, I did. Uh, I was talking about this before. Our uh, our veterans uh, memorial, if you call it that, across the street is uh, substandard, in my opinion. Um, I would like to possibly move it uh, to somewhere like Gonzalez Park or any other park. Somewhere that's not downtown where there's no parking available, it's not cramped. You know, that type of thing should be somewhere that's tranquil, people can sit and relax, pay their respects. Um, just where it's at now, a lot of people don't even know we have one. Um, we have a couple of flag posts there and, you know, they all have a concrete and a marble Plant, but you know, I'd like to see if we could move it, make it uh, more substantial. And you know, when it comes to you know Veteran Memorial Day, actually have ceremonies there as opposed to just going downtown to Jacksonville. We'll do a Pride Beach ceremony over the Atlantic Beach uh, American Legion. Right. I wonder, ask you, and I was thinking, it would be very similar because it's right on the on ramp, and you can barely there, and it was just, it was a very definitely not a, a calming memorial type time. Why you heard was traffic going by and right. loud and radios and such. So I'm like, well, you know, we could put it in one of our underutilized parks and invite the beaches here. Right, we probably and need to talk to the VFW and the American Legion guys too, make sure they're good with it. Uh, I'm like, can I add something to yours? Sure, yeah. Uh, George and I had looked at the Turn in Jacksonville, become the Purple Heart City, mm -hmm. and uh, shortly we 
pretty much agree that if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And, and we're going to have a nice ceremony and all the upper level people from the military. And then he announced his retirement. And that just kind of slipped right by the wayside. So this is news to the mic, but I'd like to look at doing that as a part of this consideration as well as the designation of the Purple Heart City, but doing it right and not just throwing the sign up. Is there a consensus on both of those items, looking to move the Veterans Memorial and to look at Purple Heart designation for the city? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the parks on the majority? Yeah. 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 Um, Sunshine South Beach Park, and we underutilize a ton of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I just like to do, have an assessment. So this would be if there's shade, if there's benches, if there's basketball courts, anything like that. State of the grass, the parking, um, if there is parking or not, um, and if we have any events there. That kind of, just a basic assessment, so we can see how we can best utilize that. Sounds like you've been attending the community conversations. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I, for a while. <laughs> and I would say, I'd venture to say that in my district, there's not a lot in the way of mm -hmm. park amenities for the citizens in that district. So I feel like a lot of the a lot of the stuff is mid right. city and Maybe further south. south. So mm -hmm. I I feel like the north end is is lacking some. So that assessment would be good. To have. Talk, talking about parks, the, the dog park. I've been going on about this for a while, but <coughs> lights in the dog park, uh, we don't have any. And this time of year, it's dark right there in August, so people are getting off work, and uh, they might want to walk their dog. So, you know, they're paying for this membership, so I, I just don't see why we can't have lights in the dog park. Uh, I don't know if anybody else thinks it's a waste of money or it's a good idea. Well, maybe if they're controlled so that they could turn them off when they left so we weren't burning the lights off. Yeah, our timers? Or yeah, our, yeah, there you go, the gate, because the gate's electronic, so yeah. when the gate closes. I mean, what we do with the golf course and the restaurant, I mean, is there any way that we could uh, upgrade our dog park to allow uh, something like Brewhound where they have a coffee bar and, and beer and let those, uh, let those people, well, let those people manage the the actual park and do some upgrades to it, and then it'll save it'll save the city money and actually maintain the park itself, and let let them be responsible for it and give them like a, a long term lease or something. Well, that's that's truly a policy issue of whether or not you want to get into sponsorships where people are operating and maintaining our facilities for. Well, how, how's it going now as far as the FOB program? How, do we know how much, it, uh, if that's covering? <coughs> we, we have quite a few members in it. I mean, I guess. So you want to well, they can get a discount. They could, I mean, but not they could get a discount. Or, I mean, they could. Um, Are you right. asking if the cost of the FOB, the membership covers the cost of the FOB? Is that the. If the co cost of the FOB is helping with the maintenance costs of the facility? Um, Yes, I think the membership on the large dog park is 75 bucks a year. Uh -huh. uh, we take 25 of that and put it to capital improvements to replace the turf uh, in 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so the remaining 50, I would say, does cover you know the cost of the park and the maintenance. We do have uh, beach rakers that go in there once a week to do a clean up. Yeah. So and what? What do you think about the idea of uh, putting lights in there? Do you think it would increase membership, or do you think it would just be, uh, be something to add to your current membership? Well, at this point, I, I, I don't see, you know, there's a demand to increase a membership because we're getting 25 new members every month uh, because of the turf. Um, I've, we've not had any inquiry to, to add lights there. There are some lights on the periphery um, I understand that you want to light it more so that it might draw <coughs> more people. Uh, certainly we can do a survey amongst the members to see what they would like. 
the Heinz family bear in mind also um, are looking to make further improvements <coughs> to their oh, thank you. Um, you know, if you want a water fountain, maybe light up the water with, with that fountain. Yeah, because I mean, I, the way I look at it now is just, there seems to be a scramble for usage down to the fact that they're battling daylight and the same in the morning. You know, if the lights came on at 7 in the morning or 6.30 in the morning, whatever, you might get people going earlier as opposed to everybody just going like right before work. Then right after work, where you get high volume of usage, we might be able to spread it out a little. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do a survey. We'll send out an email to all our members and ask for some feedback. Uh, but generally, we don't get any inquiry for lights. I mean, we have people coming in daily to renew their membership and so on. Uh, and in the monthly reports we send to city management, you can see the dog park, 25 at least new members each month. Do we have a process for members to be able to? Uh, express their likes and dislikes at the moment? You're saying we don't, you're um, not getting any? Only when they they come into the office to renew, we typically try and to engage them to see, you know, what are some of the things they like or, you know, if there are any issues. Uh, mostly it's all been very positive since we put the turf in. Mm -hmm. uh, happy with uh, the upkeep. The, the few complaints that we do get is people not cleaning up after their dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where we have the contract to go in and take care of that. Have you had anybody, like, to, to Corey's point, to talk about the nice to get a cup of coffee or make some type of concessions? Or? No, but uh, when we originally spoke, I don't know if the council recalls when Tita Green came, that was part of their sales pitch was to, you know, give some promotion to dog park members to bring over their, their dogs over to the golf course restaurant. Yeah, but they're not even getting the, the message out to the golfers, never mind the dog owners. <laughs> well, we hope to have a new group that will change. Right. Yeah. Are you allowed to have a dog out there at the golf course restaurant? That's oh, a great right. question. I, I mean, we have them. We have service dogs. I'd say. Well, we have service dogs are different, though. but yeah. if somebody walks over there from the dog park with their dog, would they be allowed to sit outside? I, I think so. I think so. the reason why not. be able to sit inside, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, restaurants have to get permitted to allow dogs outside. Um, speaking of lights, softball field? So the contractor has a notice uh, to proceed. Uh, we did issue the PO and uh, he's finishing a job, I think, in McClenny. And we, when he gets done, he'll start on the girls softball. That should begin within the next two to three weeks. And it'll take him about two weeks to complete the project. <laughs> solution that uh, the police department have looked at and uh, have passed, so to speak. Uh, there is a light on First uh, Street South, First Avenue South at the end zone. Uh, Beaches Energy came up with a shrouded fixture that's low sodium that meets the suggested uh, turtle ordinance code. Um, so they, I think on Thursday, they voted, Beaches Energy voted to approve that fixture into their inventory. And once uh, we receive that approval, I'll uh, write a memo to the city manager detailing the cost to replace about 31 of those lights on the end zones. Is that all? 31 is what you're going to need? Yes. Parking lots are pretty them with the, those, I don't know if I just noticed, but the it's like an orange, dark and orange, mm -hmm. um, yeah. amber. There you go. But what? Uh, and I mean, that's not a basic point. But I mean, why don't we just use shields? Let's shield them on the ocean side. So, so um, that, that same point was not. So really right now, we in compliance with our own ordinance, which says that if there's a turtle nest within 300 feet radius, or if there's a light rather within the radius of, of the turtle nest, uh, we shut that street light off at 11 p.m. at night. 
If it's an other light other than a street light, it's to be shut off at 9 p.m. So we comply. I think what members of the public have, have difficulty with is that uh, Neptune Beach has a stronger ordinance which says at sunset the lights go off. Uh, and it's so. The purpose of the light? Yeah. Sunset to go off? If it's within the, the radius of the turtle nest, sure. You know. Um, so. Uh, right now, the, the city attorney and, and uh, staff are looking to maybe talk to you guys about revising our ordinance um, to make it maybe a little bit stronger, uh, bring it up to code with the stronger ordinances in, in the state. In our research, we found that, um, I'm not sure who the, the party was that did the, re the, the, the survey, but out of 46 cities, uh, they ranked their ordinances and Jack's Beach came in 10th out of 46, um, which is not bad. No, you know. No. So. Where are we on the light plan for the vision plan, the light redoing the downtown lighting and all that? And is that in accordance with the turtle situation too? Or will that be? Bill back, sir? Bill's not here yet. He knows about Can't it. give you an answer on that, but we can no. get you an update on that. Well, I will say, though, that I, um, Kevin Brown, who's with the Sea Turtle Patrol, he, he was going to take me out for a ride sometime to let me see. But I was out at the beach one night. It's very obvious how light Jack's Beach is versus Atlantic Beach and Neptune Beach. So there's definitely a big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, but that's... We have a parking yeah, we've lot got on the a ocean lot of, and Right, we've got a lot of businesses that Neptune Beach and Atlantic Beach don't have. There's definitely a, a huge difference. I also think that you know, we need to weigh what's <laughs> legally we're responsible to do with what's safe. Right, exactly. Because, you know, we've got a lot of dark holes that we mm -hmm. need. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's a, more of a concern to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to just shield it from the turtle the best that we can. Public safety is number one. That's why the lighting issue came up during the vision plan because it's horrible out there. Right. That nice, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, just a, a quick recap of uh, you know, several months back. You know, we had gotten a report from a uh, firm working for DEP that actually walked to the beach from St. John's County going all the way up to Mayport. And they identified where they felt there were lighting issues of stray light coming onto the beach. And the 32 lights or so that Jason's referring to were the ones that were in our jurisdiction that were municipally owned that we felt we had some control over and could do something differently or a little better. So those are the ones that we're looking to address. Uh, but you know, to your to your point, there are a lot of other places very close to the beach where we would say public safety and uh, uh, the citizenry is is going to take precedent over over what we do there. But these particular lights were seen as issues to the turtles actually coming up on the beach and actually <laughs> nesting, as opposed to turning them off once the nest is already there. They'll never come up and create a nest if the light is on. And, and blasting out onto the sand. So this is to promote additional sea turtle nests coming up. Can we have one minute standby? Yeah. But does uh, that keep them from, does that theoretically keep them from nesting at all if they don't come to that one location where they've nested before? Because I thought the main concern was when they're hatching, the hatching yeah. is going towards the light. The, the hatching is by far the biggest issue. And you know, you do get that rare occasion of sea turtles that are nesting during the day. So yes. they, you know, they can nest at any point in time, but my understanding is if there are bright lights when they're coming up onto the beach at night, that throws them off with regards to whether or not they should be nesting there. Can I use it to, does it stop them from that? I mean, they've got to lay the eggs anyway. I, mean, I don't know if it stops them. Uh, might just lay closer to the um, water. Maybe. So, uh, can I just bring up something really quick, though? If I can get consensus on uh, Councilmember Vermont had the uh, <coughs> request to make an assessment of parks and determine all of their conditions and amenities. Is that something you'd all like to see? Sure. We're seeing the majority. So that was going to be for you, Jason. <laughs> and then, uh, Nothing else would be right. <laughs> and then the second sure, was to some, something along those lines. Right? Well, we're busy surprised. working on our capital improvements plan. <laughs> kind of, uh, just fit in nicely with that. And then the second one was uh, Councilmember Doherty's about uh, doing a I guess ultimately doing a survey of the people who use the dog park to see whether or not all of the amenities are there that they would like to have. Yep. Okay, I see the majority. Okay. 
and then you and I have talked about this, but I wanted to bring it up to all the council members, but that's um, what Mr. Marsh keeps bringing up about the format of our meetings and trying to do something at the end of our meetings with regard to some of the courtesy of the floor that comes up. And I know, Mike, you said that in your past experience, you might want to explain what has happened where you've worked before. We, we had something at the end of our meetings where each of the council members was allowed to you know, basically make a request similar to what you're doing here tonight. Uh, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that uh, you know these meetings are not, the meetings that we have next door are not the city manager's meetings. They're the council's meetings of, with the, of which the mayor is the chair. So if there's any substantive changes that you want to make with regards to the structure of the meeting itself, how items are aligned and how you proceed through them, that should really be determined by this body and, and the mayor as the elected chair of that body. Well, certain so. things, like when it's a citizen speaking, it's something that we can address. Instead of having them wait to the end of the meeting, especially on long meetings well, like tonight might be, addressing, just res not responding from the thing, but after, the, after public comment ends, we'll get back to you, we're on that, whatever it is. is yeah, there? I don't think it's realistic to expect to have much of a detailed answer. And we put a we put a sign up on the overhead now that says, you know, everybody's welcome to participate, but we'll, you know, we're not going to expect the answer right now. That, but the, the the one thing I would encourage you to consider is that uh, Mike and I have talked about this over the last few days. One of the suggestions that I haven't told you yet was now that we have our communications manager, yet, maybe we have to put something on the website that says these are the questions brought up and here are the answers from the city manager. And they're maybe in a little bit of a popular website somewhere. Okay. I, I just don't think it's fair to ask the city manager to be responsive in the same meeting. Because, you know, there are going to be some things that we just don't know. Yeah, no, no, there's there's some things that we that. do know. No. Yeah. I mean, and we can't say that we know that in the answer to the question. We're going to make them sit for two hours to maybe or maybe not address something at the end well, of the meeting. We, need, we definitely need to come up with the procedure. But, you know, I'd like to talk to him about the mechanics of that to give him an opportunity to go and find the, the answer and put post the answer on the website. I think that we, we, just from a customer service perspective, we should say, you will hear back from us in some form or fashion within 48 hours of tonight's meeting. Whether that's a thanks for your comment, we appreciate it, to here's what we have going on as it relates to the issue you brought up, or that might be an issue that hasn't been discussed by the council, if it's ever discussed, we'll let you know kind of a thing. But and there, to, to pick and choose, we answer some or don't answer some, mm -hmm. it, I think it takes some time. We'll get back to you in 40 hours. They don't need an answer tonight. If they right. bring something up, I don't think we have to give them an answer tonight, but they should get an answer of some sort within a period of time that we're all comfortable with. That's so what I'm good with that. I mean, so well, and, and I think one of the things to realize is that some of the comments or some of the questions that are asked aren't always directed at staff. Sometimes right. they're directed at the seven of you, right. and they are policy issues or right. they're thematic issues, which I can't necessarily answer. Well, then, so it's and, a, and I don't think, we have to be careful as well about discussing exactly. things that aren't uh, noticed. You know what I mean? Like if we, if we even if we uh, kind of show a <coughs> belief in something, a particular subject or topic, we can't really discuss things uh, that may then come in front of us uh, in the form of regulation or an ordinance, you know, because it has to be noted to the public. Yep. But so can we discuss a direction, though, at least? I mean, I thought that's what we originally said. Here's, here's let's, here's talk, let's just say, let's discuss it just without getting into details. Let's discuss a direction. Do we do, we do something about this or do we not? Okay, so know? for instance, Sea Turtle gives his speech every mm -hmm. time. All right. Were we going to talk about the sea turtle words? No. I think that you, your response to him is, please get, that's not an issue for me to decide. Please get with your individual council members if that's something that they want to bring up in the next workshop or meeting. They have, each have the ability to do that. That's the response on a policy issue. Um, we hate the roads, and my road's all messed up. It's been rocks for two weeks, and dust is everywhere. Okay? That's something that you have. This is the status of the project. This is where we're at, and we give those particular things. An issue of where where are we in? I guess if it's a council issue, punt it to us and tell them to reach out to their council members. Their emails and our names are all on our website. Please reach out to us if you have a particular issue that you want 
or is ordinance code changed or a policy changed, I think you can punt that. I don't think that we need to talk about those at the end of a council meeting. That's, I don't think that's the time and place to do that. The other thing is I just I want to remind you that you know we've done this for quite a long time, long before I was mayor, but I think the objective of the meeting is to get to the agenda. Right. And it's it's to vote on items that formally been presented. And my job is to keep that focus and make that happen. Agreed. And and I don't I, for a living, I go all the way down to South Volusia County and look at other county, city and county commissioners. When they open the floor up like that, it's a nightmare. It goes on and on and on. Whole, whole town hall meetings. And then, and then that's, come the too. that's right. And then come that's to one of these briefings and tell exactly. us what the concerns are. But about. citizens still can't speak at these meetings. They can, but they, don't, speak. they can email you and say, hey, would you bring this up as a topic? And I have a list of things and we're out of time and now I have to wait till next month to revisit this list and in the meantime I'm getting emails and phone calls about more issues to put on the list. Well, so we're not we're, we're not we don't have enough time for our citizens to actually engage us. But you and can talk to very you can talk to Mike one on one about He tells me to bring it to you guys. There are things that each of you have brought to me where I've told you there needs to be a consensus direction given to me or or there needs to be a formal action taken. One council member asking me to go off on a, in a direction or do something is not conducive to the longevity of the city manager. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. And, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons on these items we went through tonight. I said, you know, is there a consensus for me to proceed in a direction? Uh, I've told you, I've told the majority of you that one-on-one, -on -one, and it would be the same thing if I received a call from any of you individually that said, please, you know, go do this or, or make this happen. Um, if it was something small, we might do it, but anything of substance, I'm going to say, we need to have a consensus from council. But why don't you manage if, if Georgette's getting a list of things and she provides yeah. it to you, you can set that priority level and say, we're going to introduce this at our next, we're not going to wait for the next council, you know, whatever you want to say meeting, we're going to do it at the next council briefing because this is important. And then I can do that if everyone's comfortable with me prioritizing all of the issues that you bring to me. I, I like this format. I mean, we, we discussed, we, we did talk about maybe once a month or once every two months having a, a powwow like this where we can sit down and talk about the issues that are important to our constituents. Um, I think that's the proper way to do it. I get, I mean, I get thousands of, I have thousands of conversations a week with people that want things exactly. from, you know, Ferris wheels to soccer fields to, you know, whatever, you know, and, and I wouldn't, some of them uh, aren't going to work, and I tell them that right there and there. I don't get those kinds of things. They're just substitute. Well, but what's important to you might be not important to somebody else, and vice versa. If somebody wants a Ferris wheel, that's important to them. So I, I treat everybody the same way. That's that's my job. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to waste everybody else's time by even discussing that because we have to prioritize individually what we're going to bring to you, and then hopefully as a group, then we discuss it. But if we, if we were to discuss every single thing that comes up, it would be a full-time job. Right, it's not everything. It's these are policy issues that cannot go, that staff will not go deeper into without consent of council. Can you and it can't example? just be, um, but, oh, one was the park thing, I got that one out. The, what was Parking downtown to attract restaurants. You know, that's kind of a big thing, but I didn't even get to bring that up. The, um, Amend hands to provide city um, re revocation of the permits if needed, and that was something I discussed with um, the city attorney and planning. And that's something that would have to come from this kind of a body. And, and if we, we talked, you mentioned one thing, you mentioned one thing. I'm taking it, you have things. Oh, and so we yeah, have but to that's not all things more. that need to happen. That we meet twice a month, we talk twice a month. I mean, things like that, where if you're going to change policies prioritize your list and have two that you bring up each time. I mean, I, we have, yeah, things don't get done that quickly. It's, it's city government. They have a lot of projects and a lot of things where we're gonna rate things that are a lot more like the land development code. Different things as far, take your pick as to what we've prioritized already as a council. Those things are all side items that we can address in, in these workshops when given the opportunity to, but it's definitely not something to address and add more projects to our staff after a city council. Yeah. Uh, it's just not the time to do that. I think at the end of each briefing, if we, if, if we, if we want to bring things up, 
set a couple minutes aside. Is that enough? Would that work? Can you do that? Like 10 minutes? Or if you need an hour, let's do an hour. That's no, I, I'm just saying like, there, there are people that haven't had a chance to even discuss some issues. With the because you're, you're talking about talk, you're talking about talking. Let's talk about real things. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, we only had 30 minutes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>